adds more missing links. There is no longer a missing link between us and the chimpanzee because the fossil record has now demonstrated uh, a, a huge number of hominids, and that number is increasing all the time. Uh, organisms that are very closely related to both us and chimpanzees structurally um, and uh, must fit somewhere in between in, in terms of the actual phylogeny. Next slide. So these two witnesses, DNA evidence provides circumstantial evidence that we are related to every single organism on the earth and very closely related to our uh, closest relatives, that is the living relative the chimpanzee. The fossil record that in turn provides actual historical evidence for our relatedness. Next slide. So the real question then that I want to address next is do the DNA and fossil data require to re re reject the creation story in the scriptures? My opinion is the answer to that is no. And the reason for that is that it's not the story that has the problem but our interpretation of the story. It's interesting how many times the word interpretation was used this morning in various uh, talks to talk about what's there versus what do we think is there. And in, and in fact, as one reads a document like the Bible, or like the Book of Mormon, that you may have read 15 times, it's amazing that you wake up tomorrow morning and you have a slightly different mindset than what you've ever had before when you looked at it, and all of a sudden something brand new comes out. Or something brand, some paradigm is dropped off. How many of us go into reading a document like, say, the creation story in the Bible with a paradigm that, uh, that already exists that we don't, we're not even aware of? In fact, the most dangerous paradigms are those that we don't recognize. Next slide. So let me ask a few questions about your understanding of the creation story, and particularly the Garden of Eden and the circumstances there. If the entire earth was in a paradisiacal state, what was the role of the Garden of Eden, the purpose of an isolated location? And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Next slide. Were Adam and Eve inherently more immortal when they were placed in the garden? If so, please give me all the scriptural references that you can find. The one that's usually referred to is 2 Nephi 2.22. Let's look at that scripture. Next. And now behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen, but he would have remained in the garden of Eden, and all things which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end. That seems fairly straightforward, and it's used quite commonly to, to establish the idea that there was a paradisiacal state and that all things, everything, would have remained in the same state in which it was created. In fact, the word all things there is, is used oftentimes to, uh, to include literally all, thing, all living things, not only Adam and Eve, but everything else. Next slide. But let's read the very next verse, which is oftentimes left out, verse 23, which says, And they would have had no children, wherefore they would have remained in the state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. Is this talking about grass? Or is this just talking about the humans? Now, I have highlighted the word they because if, we use, if we're going, using proper grammatical construction, all things, or things indeed, is the noun of that sentence. They, then, in both the remainder of that sentence and the following sentence, should refer back to the previous noun. So all things are not talking about all things. It's not talking about the grass. It's not talking about the fruit trees, necessarily. It seems to be talking, when we get down to verse 23, about something that's capable of sinning, i.e., apparently, Adam and Eve. Now, we use that same vernacular today. Hey, if I hadn't gotten a car wreck, things would have been fine today. Right? All things would have been hunky-dory. would have continued on just the way they had been. Next slide. Because if all things really refers to all things in the garden, including, say, the fruit, how do we account for this scripture? 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Next slide. Now, if we look at something like a mango growing in the garden, in what uh, inflorescent stage was the mango created in the first place? Next slide. Or was it maybe a full-grown fruit? And if it was a fruit, that suggests that there was reproduction going on in the garden. Next slide. And when Eve prepared that mango for dinner that evening, how did it remain in the state in which it was created? Once it had been chowed down. Next slide. The most reasonable interpretation of 2 Nephi 2.22 is that it referred to Adam and Eve specifically, not to other organisms in the garden. Now, once 2 Nephi 2.22 is dealt with, then I would throw out the challenge, and I've done this to many students over a number of years, to identify any other scripture that tells us that Adam and Eve were inherently immortal. Interesting question. Next slide. Well, where did we get the idea that we were inherently immortal? From St. John. He says... In Paradise Lost, book 11, I, at first, meaning God, with two fair gifts created him endowed with happiness and immortality. Now, this actually came as a result of a discussion I was having with my daughter-in-law a few years ago when, we were, when I was working on this project. We were just simply talking about where this idea come from, and she said, well, gee, I just studied Milton. Uh, last year in school, and I think that that uh, they got to read Paradise Lost. So I, I got my copy of Paradise Lost, marked it all up. It's a fascinating work. It it will put any Greek myth to shame. Uh, my favorite part is the idea that the Earth is hanging by a golden chain from the corner of the Castle of Heaven. This great imagery there. But we have this paradigm. We have this paradigm. That, that's part of the baggage of Christianity that was talked about this morning in, in a couple of the talks. This is added as part of our interpretation when we read the scriptures. Oh, by the way, did Adam and Eve have hair? Did they have skin? If they had hair and skin, those are dead cells. So as a biologist, what's the difference between cell death and organismal death? Just a matter of size. Next slide. If they didn't have hair and skin, they would have looked a lot like this. <laughs> Frogs do, in fact, have moist stratified epithelium. We have keratinized stratified epithelium, which requires that the outer layers are dead. Next slide. And out of the garden, <coughs> made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, if Adam and Eve were inherently immortal, what in the world was the function of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden? This is the entire reference to the tree of life in, in Genesis 2, 9. This simply says, hey, I, there was a tree of life right in the middle of the Garden of Eden. We're not told what function it had. Next slide. Until Adam and Eve partook of the tree of the fruit of the tree through the I always get that backwards. The fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and were kicked out. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed him at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So with the Genesis account, you know, that's basically all we have. Next slide. And if we go to the Book of Mormon, it then gives us a little bit more explanation. Now we see that the man had become as God, knowing good from evil, and lest he should put forth his hand, and take also the tree of life, and eat and live forever, the Lord God placed cherubim and the flaming sword, that he should not partake of the fruit. This reference, and one other in the Book of Mormon, makes it clear that the tree of life had the capability of making someone immortal. Well, why in the world would you need to make someone immortal if they were already immortal to begin with? Next slide. 
The conclusion from this, then, is that Adam and Eve were created as moral beings, kept in a state of immortality 